Hi, welcome to the Bridge Podcasts. We hope you enjoy the following message. For more information on all that's happening at the Bridge Church, please visit www.bridge-church.com. We laughed a lot this week. It was so funny. In fact, I almost feel like I've picked up an Irish accent. <laughs> but uh, it, was, uh, it was just a wonderful, wonderful time. So uh, we're blessed. We're doing well in, in Sydney. Uh, things are going well. And uh, there's always challenges, but we overcome them. And uh, church is doing well. Family's doing very well. So we're excited about that. But I'm excited about sharing with you this morning. I'm here to encourage you. I'm here to stir you up, encourage you, and help you by the grace of God as much as I possibly can. So would you turn in your Bibles to Psalm 102? We'll just start there quickly. Psalm 102. How many of you, um, <clears throat> did you bring your Bibles, by the way? Because I don't hear much shuffling going on. Psalm 102. What's that, Barbara? I, iPhones. No, 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 no. Let's get back to the Bibles, the real thing. You're too advanced for me, Barbara. That's what you are. So how many of you believe in, how many of you kind of feel? I mean, you know, we preach a lot at the moment and we're trying to stir people up, you know, a lot of the times. You know, you hear preachers and they're trying to stir you up and I guess we all do that. But you know, I want to come from a different angle this morning. And the angle I want to come from is this, that God is actually stirring you up himself. There is something happening right now in the body of Christ worldwide that we sense that God is doing something. Can you feel that? Is it, does any, has, any of you, has any of you felt that, that there's something happening, there's change taking place? God is getting the church ready for something that is bigger than any of us can actually imagine. And I believe, and I've said it for a long time, and I'll have another book here tonight that talks about revival, but I've said it for a long time that, that, that I've seen actually the end time church in revival, and it's an incredible thing. It's a thing where God is just going to do stuff that we never imagined he would do. See, at the moment, the devil's a liar. He's always a liar. But he makes us believe that this is going to be the status quo forever. You know what I mean? That we're just going to struggle through life and, well, you know, we've got a wee bit here and a wee bit there. And it's not going to be like that. The end time church is a glorious church. <clears throat> the end time church is a church full of power. The end time church is a, is a church full of the Holy Spirit doing incredible things that you never even believed he would do for you or for your family, for anybody else. And so right now, we've got to get ready for that. We've got to be positioned for what is coming. And so I want to share a few things with you. But it says in Psalm 102, if you're there, if you're not, I'll read it. It says, verse 13, it says, you will arise. This is you, God. You will arise and have mercy on Zion. Whenever you see Zion in the Old Testament, it's always referring to the church. So you could put in their church. So it says, God, you will arise. You will arise and have mercy on Zion. You know, there's, there's two things. There's mercy and grace. Grace is, is, is when, you know, we, we, the grace of God works in our lives because we're children of God, because we, you know, we do certain things and God covers us with grace. Mercy is a little bit different. Mercy is when God does stuff for you that you don't actually deserve. Amen? So God's saying, you know, in spite of the, the condition that the church is in, there's going to come a time when God is going to arise. It's an incredible picture of God actually arising and having, having mercy on the church, when God will just start to do stuff. And you know, like Pastor Bernie's been teaching you, this is what we got to see. We've we got to look for supernatural events that's going to take place in your personal life. That God is going to do supernatural things in your life. He's going to do supernatural things in your family's life. He's going to give you breakthroughs that you only dreamt were possible, but you've got to dream those things. There's coming a time, and I believe it's right now. I believe we're in a season right now for God to arise. But I want to give you a picture of how God arises and what activates. God never does anything alone. He's chosen to work with man. So God and man always work together. So there's a part. God is always ready. But he's looking for us to activate that readiness, if we can say it like that. And this scripture brings it out really nicely. It says there, For you will arise and have mercy on Zion, the church, for the time to favor her, yet the set time has come. So God knows there's going to be a time when he's going to favor the church with incredible mercy. It says then, given us insight into when we should be ready. The next verse says there, for your servants take pleasure in her stones. He's talking about the church. And show favor to her dust. He's saying, you know, I will arise and, and, and pour out my mercy upon the church when my church 
actually takes pleasure in my stones. He's still talking about the church. You know, when they take pleasure in building the church, when they take pleasure in the dust, he's talking about the small, seemingly insignificant things. You know, when my church starts to take pleasure in that, when they start to get excited about the church, about building the church, about prayer meetings, about coming to church regularly, about reading their Bible, about praying for the sick. Those are kind of the big things. The smaller things are when you just do the little things, when you show an act of kindness to someone in the street, or when you even if you usher at the door, God says, I can build my church through people who are like that. Amen? That's what God is, is looking for on our part. He's saying, when, when you take interest in me, I will take interest in you. Oh, hallelujah. Now, not everybody, you should be more excited about that. Not everybody, not everybody's going to be ready for that. A lot of people say, well, you know, they just coast. But I remember when Barbara and I got born again, we were actually excited. I was so excited. When we, we went through that move of God in South Africa, I was so excited about the, the presence of God. These, these revivals where people get excited, how do we analyze that? Because we read about great Scotland as being great revivals. How do we analyze a great revival? A great revival is when God just kind of comes. He's, it's, it's His grace and His mercy. Just kinda, he just touches a generation or He'll touch a people. And all of a sudden, they know that His presence is there. And so there's, a, there's an energy that springs up. It's like, whoa, come on, let's, let's pray like we never prayed before. Let's believe God like we never believed before. This is exciting. God is here. Amen? You've read about it. But I believe that this generation is going to experience that. I believe that with all my heart. I've, I've believed that for the last 30 years. This is not something I'm sharing with you just to tickle your ears. I have believed that. That's embedded in me, that revival. I have seen that very thing is going to happen, I believe, in our, in our lifetime, in our generation. So all this stuff is going on with ISIS and all that. The, the devil's getting really, really concerned because he knows the time is coming when God's people are going to be actively involved in the church. Pastor, what is it that you want me to do in the church? How can I serve you in the church? And I'm not preaching this for Pastor Bernie. I'll preach this wherever I go. Big, small, big church, small. It doesn't matter because I sense that is the season that we're in. We're sensing that God has drawn us to something to prepare us for a great outpouring. And guess what? Here's the most exciting part. That God, and I'm going to talk about this tonight, please come tonight. God has left this generation, I believe, like no other generation, to experience that. Do you know what that makes you? That makes you and I the most privileged generation who've ever walked the planet for Jesus. I need a little more excitement for that. The most, the, I mean, come on, now let's get a hold of this. This is the vision that you've got to see. That we could be the most amazing generation that God has especially left for this time. So there is a stirring taking place right now. God is doing something right now. He's positioning up us for something great and something powerful. Now, having said that, would you turn then? I've got three points, and I hope I get through them today. Would you turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 19, talking about positioning? So we're going to get positioned for God. And I'm going to challenge you uh, in a nice way to, uh, to position yourself for God. Before you leave this place today, I believe that you're going to start to see in your own life a positioning for you. That there's some, something going on that you haven't necessarily positioned yourself in, but you're going to start to do it. Listen, if we come to church and just get sermons and we go away and, and we, that was a good sermon, but we don't actually do something about it, we're wasting our time. Amen? So for all of us, we've got, to, we've got to find it. God, what is the next thing? I guess that's what I'm saying. What is the next thing that you want me to do? How do I position myself to be used in this great end time move of God. Is that okay? So there's this guy in Luke 19. There's this guy, Zacchaeus. And uh, <clears throat> Luke 19, are you there? I'll read this to you quickly. It says, Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector. He was rich, and he sought to see, you know, look at this, he sought to see who Jesus was. One of the translations says he was desperate to see who Jesus was. He was rich. He was a tax collector, so he was unpopular. He had disadvantages in the natural. Nobody liked the tax collector. It was like everybody would ignore the tax collector. And it says he was short, so he was a short tax collector. You're getting a picture. 
He might have been fat as well, but it doesn't say that. But it's like, I'm beginning to see a picture here. So here's this little guy that nobody likes. He, pay, he takes your money and he runs, you know? But, but he heard, I'll just paraphrase, but he heard, he heard, you can read this when you get home. He heard, he heard that Jesus is going to come by. But did you hear about that guy, Jesus? And he says to his mate, no, who's that? He says, he's a miracle worker. It sounds like he's passing by this way. He says, really? Yeah. He says, there will probably be a big crowd there, you know. So if you want to see him, he should be there. So he says to his wife, you know what? I'm going to go today. I won't be long. Stay with the kids, making this bit up. I'll go up because, <laughs> because there's this famous guy is walking by, and I want to be there. So what he does is he goes there, and he sees the crowd. Now, remember, he's short, and nobody likes him. If he tried to get in there, he'd say, get away, you know, get but, but what he does is he realizes he's, dis he's disadvantaged. Like all of us, in some way, are disadvantaged. There is something about all of us that we know that possibly people don't like. You know? And then we quit. We go to church and somebody doesn't like us, don't like your hair, they don't like the color of your dress, or maybe you bought the same dress, and they say something to you, and then you quit, and you don't come back. We're all, we all get through disadvantaged times, right? If you know what I mean. If you're a pastor, you'll know what I mean. Thank you for that. Okay, so, so, so anyway, he says, he says, well, I'm going again. I don't care. So he gets there, but he realizes he's too short. Everybody's tall, and he's short. So he knows if he stands there, he's not going to see Jesus. So he's so desperate, all he wants to do is to see Jesus. So he runs ahead of the crowd. Sometimes you've got to leave the crowd behind. He runs ahead of the crowd, and he looks for an advantage position because he's short. There's always an advantage position that God will have you find if you want to go to the next place in God. Oh, hallelujah. There'll always be a place. So he runs, and there he sees this tree. He's probably not a good climber, but he thinks, you know, I can do this. I'm going to get up that tree. I want to see this guy when he comes by. And so there he is, perched up the tree. He's probably been mocked. What are you doing up there? Uh, the tax collector, they're all laughing at him. You know, imagine I'm trying to climb the tree. But he's up there and he's holding on to the branches. And he's waiting to see Jesus coming by. Because he heard, he heard that he's coming by. We've heard that there's going to be revival. We sense that there's going to be revival. Are we positioned for it? And so Jesus comes along. And here's the incredible thing about it. Jesus is going somewhere else. He's actually going to Jerusalem. But as he gets to that spot, here's a guy up the tree. There is thousands of people following Jesus. There's throngs. And every time Jesus stopped, the whole crowd would stop. You can imagine. But he gets to this place, and all of a sudden, he stops. They must have said, why is Jesus stopping? He's the miracle worker. What is he doing? He stopped. He's talking to some guy up a tree. Amen. They're having a dialogue. God and the tree man. They're talking. And he says to Zacchaeus, come down for today I must, I must come to your home. I must come to your home. Amen. Zacchaeus couldn't believe his luck, one of the translations says. Scrambled down a tree and he starts to talk to Jesus. And uh, Jesus goes home with them. But the point of this story is incredible, is that his action of positioning himself caused a sudden intervention of God in his life. Oh, hallelujah. Although he was disadvantaged, it caused God to stop in his tracks, as it were. You know, when you start to position yourself to go to another level in God, God will stop in his tracks and take notice. Yeah, Isaiah 60 talks about a rise shine and your light will come. You know, when, when you arise, it arouses God, if I can say that. God is aroused by you when you arise. It's like God says, oh, wait, Tom is looking for me in a greater way. Tom believes that I can use him for revival. Tom's be Tom believes that I can heal him. Tom believes that I can get him through whatever he's going through. God is aroused when you arise. Hallelujah. 
Arise, shine, for your light has come. Amen. And so what happens? He gets on the phone to his wife, Zacchaeus, and he says, he says, I, I, uh, she says, where have you been? <laughs> where have you been? <laughs> His wife's ever say that in Scotland. Where have you been? <laughs> well, at the moment, I've just, you know, I, I went for a walk. He's trying to be diplomatic. I'm making this bit up. I went for a walk, and I ended up climbing a tree. And as I was up the tree, God walked by. And God started speaking to me. And she says, you're crazy. Have you been drinking again? He says, no. And the other thing is make the bed. Clean the house. Because I'm bringing him home. She says, who are you bringing home? He says, I'm bringing God home. G-O-D. God is going to stay at our house tonight. Or because he climbed a tree and he positioned himself. He was desperate to see God. That night, God went home. God slept in his bed. The Bible doesn't actually tell us, but at least Jesus would have rested there, whether he stayed the night or not. But it is incredible. Can you imagine? His sons and his daughters would never have been the same. Growing up, they would have said to those little boys or those little girls, what is different about your house now that wasn't the same before? What was it? Oh, God stayed with us one night. Why? Because my daddy was desperate to see him. He just wanted to see him. But because of that desperation, God come home. And Jesus actually said, salvation has come to your house because he positioned himself. Isn't that an incredible story? It's an incredible story. Point number two. Let's go to the next one. Point number two. So, the, so he, he positioned himself for God's intervention. There's a story, you don't have to go there, in, uh, in, in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. The armies are coming against King Jehoshaphat, a great king, and the, you know, they're surrounded by, by the enemies of, of Israel. And uh, at Judah, actually. And, uh, and so they don't know what to do in the natural And then God says something. I'll read it to you from my notes here. He says this. He says, you will not need to fight in this battle. So they're they're, they're outnumbered. There is no way in the natural that they can win the battle. It is impossible. An impossible situation. You know, there is times when we go through, we have to go through seemingly impossible situations. All of us have to reach a place where we know this is impossible. Amen? You see, there's two bits. You, you have to operate by faith, and then you get breakthroughs, and you say, well, praise God, I applied my faith, and that was great, and God answered my faith. That's great. We've been taught that, and I know you've been taught that well in this church. There's another place where you know that for you to get through this thing, you've done everything, but it's going to take an absolute miracle. Only a God intervention can do this. God, I don't know what to do. You ever been there? I, God, I've no idea. In the natural, this is impossible. So God will allow these impossible situations, as it were, to come your way to see what you're going to do. This is exactly what happened here. And so they're surrounded. There's massive armies on all sides. And in the natural, they're going to die. And he says to God, he says, you know, God, Basically, we don't know what to do. And God says this. Let me read this to you. It's incredible. God says, you will not need to fight in this battle. Oh, hallelujah. He says, position yourselves. Stand still. And see the salvation of the Lord who is with you. O Jude in Jerusalem, do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow, go out against them for the Lord is with you. In other words, take your stand. Take your position. Just stand in me. You won't have to fight this battle. I'm going to do this battle. So he says, okay, I still don't know what to do. What must I do? And in the next bit, but it says, and, and he bowed himself, and he worshiped, and he praised God. And so they positioned himself with praise. Do you know that sounds easy, to position yourself with praise? But when you position yourself with praise, 
The enemy knows he's defeated. Amen. All they did, it was like, God, shouldn't we, shouldn't we, you know, let, let's get 10,000 angels. Let's, let's pray them in. Let's do this. Let's do that. Let's do the next thing. Give us a strategy. And, and God says, no, stand still. Take stock, basically, of your salvation. Consider, meditate for a minute, just for a minute, what your salvation actually is. What is it that I have done for you? If I could deliver you from eternal hell, then I can deliver you from this little skirmish. To you, it might be big, but to me, it's nothing. Consider, just consider that the devil could not with his, all these demonic forces, he could not hold you captive. Just consider that for a minute. When you says yes to Jesus, the enemy could not hold you back simply because you believed in, in your heart and confessed your, with your mouth Jesus and the devil was holding on with everything he could and he had to let you go. God says, just consider for a minute what I have done for you. So you meditate, you think, you consider. Am I going to heaven? Yes, I am. Can the devil stop it? No, he can't. Isn't that an incredible thought? That when you die, you're going to heaven. The devil would love to take you to hell, but he can't. It's impossible. Well, God's saying, well, when you're going through the little skirmishes of life, here's what I want you to do. Consider your salvation, the entire deal. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. So here's what I want you to do. I know it's going to be hard, but right now, I want you to start singing. What am I going to sing? It was revelation he got. And he says, we're going to sing, praise you the Lord for his mercy endures forever. That was it. Praise you the Lord for his mercy endures. So they were singing about the mercy of God. Let's sing about that salvation aspect that belongs to me. Mercy belongs to me. I am a child of God. Grace belongs to me. I am a child of God. Healing belongs to me. I am a child of God. Prosperity belongs to me. I am a child of God. Peace belongs to me. I am a child of God. The whole shooting match belongs to me because of what Jesus did. God says, well, sing about it. Just let me hear you sing about it. Oh, hallelujah. But it's hard to sing. But it's hard to sing when you're in that place. You ever been there? I teach this stuff all over the world, and yet I know I've been in places where it's like, gee, I, I can't sing. God says, sing. The only thing right now to do, Tom, is to sing. Don't whisper it. Sing it, because when you sing it, the, oh, I love this. When you sing it, when you sing it, when you sing it, it's like, the de it's like God takes the, the devil. Do you mind if I use you as an illustration, brother? Stand up, stand up. I want to show you this. Just bow down because you're a big lad. Bow down. It's like, <laughs> what's your name? Joe. Joe. Just bow down a wee bit, Joe. It's like, it's like, it's like God's, and you're the singer. What's your name? Lee. Lee. So it's like, it's like God takes the devil and says, okay, now listen to him. Sing. <laughs> sing. God's mercy is endure forever. You are defeated. No, no, I said sing it. <laughs> Glory to God, you're down, I'm up. That's right, that's enough, that's enough. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? It's like, it's like God says, you, li you will listen to him. You will m I will make you listen to him. Thanks. You, good. <laughs> you need to brush up and you're singing a wee bit there. Like. <laughs> that was, you see how hard that was for you there? It was like, <laughs> I'll rather speak. No, God says, sing it. Oh, man. You know, when... You <laughs> See, this is the thing. This is part. We don't know this stuff, a lot of us. So we just, you know, we just get by. But when you sing, God, Jesus says in Hebrews 2 12, I'm going to sing with you. So when you sing, the devil doesn't hear you singing. You just think you're a pretty little singer. You know, God, God, you know, the devil says, There's another voice. Who's that voice? My goodness, that's the voice of God. So the devil hears a duet going on. Then the Holy Spirit says, I'm, I'm in in this act as well. <laughs> You're not going to leave me out of this act. So you, is this, does this sound strange? Read the, I think I put something in that book about this. But when you start to sing 
It's like the devil says, oh, no, 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 no. Retreat, boys, retreat. They're singing again. See, the, the, the devil knows the Bible better than you do. So he knows that verse. He said, don't let them sing. Because if you read on there, what happens is when they start to sing, the enemy gets confused. That's what it says. They started killing themselves. So when you start to sing, the devil says, geez, I'm confused now. What was I doing? What was that guy's name I was trying to attack? I even forget where he lives. I mean, this is, this is, I mean, this is Bible. We have complicated it so much. We become so religious. We are stuff, trying to get everything absolutely right when God's just saying, sing with me and get a revelation. See the picture that when you sing, I'm singing with you. We're in this together. What's that program they have, talent program they have in Britain? Good. What? The Brits got talent. Britain's got talent. They haven't had... <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not, no, I'm not going. No, no, I'm not going there. Okay, okay. Are you getting the picture? Did you get that point number two? Okay, so point number three. So you position yourself with praise. It's the hardest thing to do. Point number three, and then we're finished. Uh, on 1 Kings 4, 8 to 10, I'll just I'll read, read through this for you. It happened one day that Elisha went to Shuman, where there was a, no, a notable woman, and she persuaded him to eat some food. So it was, as often as he passed by, he would turn in there to eat some food. As she said to her husband, now look, I know that this is a holy man of God who passes by us regularly. Please, let us make an upper room on the wall and let us put a bed for him there and a table and a chair and a lampstand Slamp stand, so it will be whenever he comes to us, he can turn in there. This is probably the most powerful point. She positioned herself to receive the man of God. She positioned herself to receive the man of God. She pre prepared a place to receive him. Now, you know, this man was a prophet. So it wasn't just a man she was receiving. What she was receiving was everything that that man represented. A man of God represents more than just a preacher. But she was re he represented the kingdom. So she was, she was positioning herself, herself to receive the kingdom by making him a bed. She was positioning herself to receive the word of God because that man carried the word. She was positioning herself for more than she even thought. It goes on and it says this. And he said, what then is to be done for her? He asked his servant. And Gehazi answered his servant, actually, she's got no son. And her husband is old. In other words, she's got no future. She's got no legacy. She's got nothing to pass on whatever she's got. And when he called her, she stood in the doorway. Then he said, about this time next year, you shall embrace a son. And, and she said, no, my Lord. She didn't even believe him. Man of God, do not lie to your maidservant. But the woman conceived and bore a son when the appointed time had come, of which Elisha had told her. But God was basically saying, because you've prepared a place for the man of God, because you've honored the man of God, honoring is a big deal. Because you've honored the man of God, God was saying through Elisha, ask her, just ask her, is there anything she would like? Amen. What is, she, what, is she, what is she looking for? Because she's honored you, man of God, I want to do something for her. What does she want? What does she need? She doesn't have a son. Man of God, speak the word of the Lord. And tell her this time next year, she'll have a boy, she'll have a son. In other words, she positioned herself by honoring the man of God for a future legacy. Judah, by praising the Lord, positioned himself for the nation to be delivered. Zacchaeus, by positioning himself up that tree, 
got his whole family to be saved. See, what happens is when you start to position yourself, when you start to say, God, what is the next thing I've got to do? What is it? Show me. How do I position myself for what's going on in my life? How do I position myself to get healed of this terrible thing that's been hanging on to me forever? How do I position myself to get my family who are broken, who are whatever, they're going through hell? How, how, what, what am I supposed to do now to get to that place? God, what am I supposed to do? Tell me what I'm supposed to do. I want to be positioned for the next thing, the next big thing that you're going to do in my life. And it is a big thing. God wants to do a massive thing in your lives. Why? Because he's preparing you for what's coming. What do you want from me? That's what God's saying to us this morning. What is it that you want from me? And I'm going to pray that as you go away with this message, that you will go away this afternoon and just spend a little bit of time and ask God, God, what is it? You probably know already. Probably God has been dealing with you in your heart. What is it, God, I've got to do to position myself for what you want to do in my life? Some of you already know you've got kids, you've gone off track, you've, you've, you've got a husband, you've got a wife, you've got, you've got people that in your family who are sick. You've, there's all kinds of things. There's a neighbor who needs the Lord. There's something. You know there's plenty to do in the kingdom. How can I position myself, Lord, for your kingdom? And as you start to do that, I believe miraculous things will start to happen. I have, honestly, I've got to believe for the miraculous. I've got to believe for a revival that will sweep the nations. I cannot believe for anything less than that. I think it would be wrong of me to believe for anything less than that. And we see what God has promised us, and we see the potential. But revival actually starts not by some great man getting up and preaching and everybody comes like we've seen in the past. The revival in the end times is going to be through individuals. Just people, There's going to be revival through individuals like you and me, just kind of normal people. And, and God's going to stir something and something is going to happen in your life that is going to be incredible, just amazing, supernatural, something that you could not even imagine. A miracle and impossibility become impossible. That is the God that we serve. And that is the time that we're living in right now. We're living in a season of tremendous opportunity. A season of miraculous. Go away and ask God, like your pastor has said, like Pastor Ben is saying, and dream these dreams. See these things. Don't go away today and do nothing. And even if there seems to be nothing, ask God, show me, God, I want to be involved in building the kingdom. I want to be part of this great end time move of God. Tonight, I'm going to share with you on a now generation, a generation, the, 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 the now generation, the characteristics of that now generation. What will it look like? It'll add on to what I'm talking about this morning, and it may give you a little more insight, specifically the practical things to do. Is that okay? And we just pray. Josh, could you just come up and just uh, play? I enjoyed your ministry so much this morning too, brother. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Remember to visit our website, www.bridge-church.com and connect with us via Facebook and Twitter.